Welcome to the University of California at Berkeley and to the state of California. It's a pleasure to have all of you visiting the Golden State today. I'm Per Peterson. I'm the Executive Associate Dean uh, for the College of Engineering here at UC Berkeley. And together with Keith Bowman and Greg Washington, we've helped to organize this panel session on innovation and facilities. I don't want to take any more time than is absolutely necessary to just give a few housekeeping uh, tips before, before I turn things over to Greg, who will lead the panel discussion. Um, we're, we, we really appreciate having you all come and visit. When we've concluded the panel session, at that point we'll have a brief introduction because we'll have a tour of our new Jacobs uh, Institute uh, for Design Innovation uh, right across the street here. You'll be hearing more about it uh, during the panel session and then we have Bjorn Hartman here who is stepping in to provide an introduction. Uh, Greg will uh, be making a, a few brief remarks about something tragic that happened on Sunday, which was that we lost Professor David Dornfeld uh, to a sudden heart attack. He's the director of the JDI, and so it's been a bit of a shock for us, uh, but uh, we, we still hope that this can be a truly um, inspirational uh, time that you spend here and, and that, that we all leave invigorated uh, looking forward into the future. So after that tour, which will be an open house format where you'll be able to go any place you want, there will be students and, and faculty and researchers that you can meet with. We'll be reconvening for reception and a banquet and a wonderful banquet speaker, Paul Jacobs, at Cal Memorial Stadium. And I'm sure that uh, you'll, you'll enjoy that as well. It's another exemplary example of a, a major retrofit for seismic purposes. Let me at this point turn things over to Greg uh, to moderate this panel session. Welcome. And we, I am just so glad to see you all here on the first day of the conference so early. Uh, you do know uh, that we are at Berkeley. And so at any moment in time, a protest can erupt, so just, just be calm, no worries. <clears throat> but we're, we're excited to start off this uh, conference in this way, in this manner, talking about some really innovative uh, facilities. And those of you who have your programs with you, you'll see that we have a number of uh, speakers who will talk about uh, various facilities that they've uh, placed at their institutions, and then that was to be uh, led by a tour of the Jacobs Institute for Design Innovation with its faculty director, uh, Dr. Dave Dornfeld. And uh, so Dave was supposed to be leading that tour and, and, and engaging with us. And then uh, this weekend, we, we, we lost Dave, and it was a tragic loss. Um, he's, he's a great guy. Uh, I've known him from the work that he's been doing in the state in manufacturing and the work that he's been doing there uh, previously in robotics. He's just a, a, a fabulous individual. I never heard a bad word said about him uh, throughout uh, all of my dealings with people here in the state. And it was, it was a shocking loss for me personally, uh, but also I know for the faculty and staff and people here at Berkeley. And so uh, on that note, what I would think would be totally appropriate is that um, we have a moment of silence in honor of Dave. Thank you. And so as we move forward, what I'd like to do is move into the discussion of this panel. And the goal of this panel uh, was to highlight four different established innovations in engineering facilities. We know that there are many others out there, and that's why we have time for discussion. Uh, but we wanted to highlight four, and the featured innovations include buildings uh, for innovative purposes, as you'll see here uh, going forward, uh, some shared facilities, and also uh, uh, innovations in actual infrastructure that would be used for uh, engineering uh, educational purposes. Uh, <clears throat> the coordinators, of this particular panel 
are myself, also uh, Pierre Peterson, and uh, Pear, where are you? Are you just here? And Keith Bowman as well. Please raise your hand, Keith. Uh, please give them a round of applause. You'll see from the quality of the facilities to talk about, this is uh, uh, both Pear and Keith did a tremendous job in pulling this panel together. And I want to thank in advance our speakers. Uh, please don't give me any credit for this. I, I go by the old Southern adage, if you see a frog at the top of a flagpole, you know he didn't get there by himself. And so these guys, they've done, they've done a tremendous job in the facilities they have. And so <clears throat> we'll get presentations from four individuals highlighting four facilities. Uh, Jeff Durick, who is the uh, Dean of Engineering at Case Western Reserve University, will talk a little bit about ThinkBox. Uh, Louis Martin Vega, who is the Dean of Engineering at uh, North Carolina State University, will talk about the Hunt Library. Dave Munson Jr., Dean of Engineering at the University of Michigan, Ann Arbor, will talk about the M-City and the G.G. Brown uh, renovation project. And then uh, Shankar Sastry will close it out, uh, the Dean of Engineering at the U uh, University of California, Berkeley, uh, and he will discuss the Jacobs Institute, and then we will then go and visit the Jacobs Institute uh, located here. And so without any further ado, I would like to turn it over to Jeff. So what I'd like to describe is basically our work in creating or moving from what was a small facility that we thought of as a maker space for our School of Engineering students and really turning in this to a much larger initiative in design and innovation to impact not just our campus but really the Northeastern Ohio region. And I think one of, there's three really, what I think are really unique aspects of this particular project and they are scope, scale, and access. And so I'm going to describe a little bit about each of those. So we originally, I think you, some of you may remember that about two years ago I presented the original version of ThinkBox in a 4,500 square foot facility. We were averaging about 4,000 student visits a month. And these were primarily engineering students who were coming in and using the space in an extracurricular way using the 3D printers, the printed circuit board routers to do their sort of senior projects or other type of experiential projects in their classrooms. But we really started thinking about how we could leverage the entire assets of the university and parts of Northeast and Ohio to really provide a, a different mix, if you will, a conversion from a makerspace to an economic development engine. So we found this building on our campus. It's a seven-story building. It's uh, 49,000 square feet, about 7,000 square feet per floor that was being used as a warehouse. It didn't look at all like this when we started. But we embarked on a process of basically having each floor serve sort of a continuum among an evolution of a project from sort of a thinking and doing space to maybe a student team getting together, making a first prototype, thinking about how they're actually going to fabricate it and scale it up, if you will. And then sort of entrepreneurial support services as well as incubation. So this is what the building looks like now. We've raised about $37 million to equip this, this particular space. And our projects then essentially move up the ladder, move up from floor to floor. Now when I say there's three unique aspects, that, and, and access being one of those, this is open to anybody. That is, engineering students, any student on campus, any faculty, any student from any nearby university, our alumni and businesses. In fact, our 90,000th student visitor was a student from Cleveland State, and I saw Annette Carlson here somewhere. Who's the, there she is. So our 90,000th student visitor was a student from Cleveland State. So while the first three floors really draw on inspirations from, say, for example, the Stanford D School, and other types of things as we move up into the building into like the fourth floor, for example, what we've done is consolidated all of our design and um, uh, fabrication facilities, all of our shop spaces, drill presses, milling machines, CNC machines from around campus into one location. We've expanded that space by about 50% in both time and space. So what I mean by that is we now have staff supervisors in the space to expand the, the temporal footprint of access to these facilities as well. 
On the fifth floor, I think, is one of the really unique aspects as well, and we stole this idea from Dave Munson and University of Michigan's Wilson Center, where basically we previously had no location on campus for all of the student clubs to, to work together. So our mini Baja team, our robotic lawnmower, our Lunabots, our rocket clubs will each have different cells and be able to share ideas back and forth across each other. And one floor below that have access to all of the milling machines, drill presses, and things like that. Now when we look at sort of the impact on this particular space, when I talk about the scope of this, one of the things we've done is we've worked with our law school to bring in their intellectual property venture clinic. We've worked with our university tech transfer office to bring them in. Our Weatherhead School of Management's Entrepreneurship Club now has space there. And our faculty from the law school, the Weatherhead School of Management, and other services or other programs, parts of the university, now are co-located in this space. So as basically as student and faculty teams move up the ecosystem, they have access to these services all in the same building. The seventh floor that we're currently designing, but we're not building it out yet, is basically incubator space, so highly flexible spaces. So already in the first couple of years, we've had 35 student startups come from this. A number of those, whoops, a number of those have gone on to, for example, exhibit at the Consumer Electronics Show. We had five student startups there two years ago, seven one year ago, and 21 student startups this year at the Consumer Electronics Show alone. So it's a unique space in terms of leveraging all of the assets of a university, as well as using assets from, from others providing unique sort of scope, scale, and access. I'll point out one last thing before I turn it over to Louie. So as most of you know, Case Western Reserve is a private university in Cleveland, Ohio. The state of Ohio gave a million dollars to this project from the capital budget. So a million dollars from a state capital budget going to a private university is pretty unique. But it didn't go for the building per se. It went for the economic impact that this, re that this system is supposed to have. And this is just one example of the metrics we now provide the state in, in this unique space. So thank you very much. I'll turn it over to Louie now. Okay, swing over here. Sure. Thank you, Jeff. Okay, well, I'm going to go to another level here because even though the idea is engineering facilities, I have to say this is a university facility. It turns out that... It's right there where the engineering college is on Centennial Campus, and obviously we derive tremendous benefits from it. Hunt Library, James Hunt was a former governor, really focused on education, and it was through his ideas that we really started establishing this new campus over on NC State. The building itself, right, is something that really was designed in such a way to send a very different message. NC State, its architecture, quite traditional brick architecture and so on, what you're talking about is something here, a very iconic design, a Norwegian firm that was brought in really to demonstrate the idea of moving forward, right, paths forward. Now, tucked behind there is the Centennial Campus, and our engineering students are the main beneficiaries of that. But like I said, it does serve the whole university. A key to this has to do with spaces, and you're going to see an underlying theme is collaboration, right? You also see the kind of designs that are there. That we're trying to create, the whole idea was to create a very immersive environment. And it's, it's non-traditional in many ways. I mean, there are the traditional settings that you see there, but you also see things like this. So what, what is this? I'm an old manufacturing guy. In fact, I'm really sad to hear about Dave because I've known him for years. This is an ASRS system for those of us in manufacturing. They call it a book bot in the library. But basically, two million volumes are stored there in about one ninth <coughs> the space that you would have normally mm -hmm. to use for something like that. And then you have virtual retrieval systems and so on that really bring all of this forward very quickly. What you also have are spaces that are set up for visualization. A lot of the theme is visualization, eventually simulation and so on. Immersive areas for research and teaching, that's a big part of this. Uh, you can see the recreation in the background there of a medieval village. And in fact, this is mm -hmm. a group of students that we have in engineering and public policy and humanities. Beautiful. And you recreate all sorts of scenes, for example, from the past with that in real life environments. Programs like gaming programs. There's a big gaming hub on the East Coast around Raleigh, North Carolina, 
what they have is they have a whole environment there that isn't just the video games. We're talking about, again, all sorts of simulation and coursework around these themes. And then also facilities for media production. That's a big part of what's involved in this video conferencing, for sure. The development of partnerships. What you have there is an AVROTC, and in fact, there's a lot of work there where you can create the environment of literally being on an aircraft carrier and working through simulations and things related to that. But the key theme, again, is collaboration. All sorts of over 100 different little rooms and places for people to get together and collaborate. You see even more the colors that are brought into this and even more collaborate. It's just a wonderful place to be also, and that's, that's, that's part of it as well. So, you know, just to wrap this up, I do have a little bit of time. It says a perfect space for everyone. Uh, the Hunt Library, right over Lake Raleigh, it's a beautiful place to be. And again, it's a really big competitive advantage. Now, I have a minute and a half, and I'm going to move away from this to a little anecdote. What impact does something like this have? This library was opened up in January of 2013. That summer, I had my two grandkids visiting in Raleigh. One was in high school, one was in middle school. Fourth of July, we went out to get, eat some hot dogs, right? And then they said, Grandpa, what are you going to do now? And I said, we're going to go to the library. Oh, the library, right? <laughs> <laughs> we go to the Hunt Library, okay? We start walking around. Not a ton of people there on 4th of July. We go up to the second floor. One of my students in electrical engineering is there with his dad, who'd come down from Fairfax, Virginia, and a couple others, working with a group from UC Davis on a startup company. He comes out. He recognizes. We start talking. I tell him these are my grandkids. He tells them, he says, would you guys like to join us? And I said, yeah, sure, go ahead, okay? An hour later, I come by. I can't get them out of there, okay? <laughs> Literally that whole afternoon, we were ready for hot dogs again after four hours. But little examples, but the bottom line is these environments stimulate many, many different ways of thinking and doing things. But it really is having environments where people feel that they really want to be a part of this. You're, you don't see very many books in this library. Again, the book bot and all that. What you do see are all ways of connecting and collaborating. When it really comes down to a lot of this is the interaction between people. Being right there where our engineering campus is on Centennial Campus, the worth of this is phenomenal for us. We can't officially call it the engineering library, but we kind of do in a way. And, you know, we're delighted just to have the facility there. It's just a tremendous innovation for us. Thank you. I was asked to talk about two things. This is the second one. Uh, the first thing I was asked to talk about is M City which is a test track for driverless cars. I spoke about that at last meeting, and not everything's going to fit into five minutes, so I thought I would give that one a short shrift. M-City is a test track that has uh, some building facades to uh, mimic an urban area. It has pavements of all different types. It has terrain, railroad crossings, traffic circle, all kinds of things. We have a partnership with about 60 different companies, including most of the major OEMs, plus uh, the Tier 1 suppliers, and insurance companies, communication companies, and what have you. If anybody wants to talk about driverless cars, I'll talk all evening about them, but uh, not right now. So instead, I'm going to transition to the second topic, uh, which is some improvements we've made in mechanical engineering. I think everybody's witnessed the same thing in ME. <coughs> ME now is way broader than it ever used to be. And now big emphases in nano and in bio. When I started as Dean of Engineering at Michigan, my mechanical engineering faculty wanted a new building. We'd priced that out. At that time, this is 10 years ago, it was going to cost $165 million. I told them I couldn't do that. They were not happy with me. I said, listen, I'll promise you a $165 million building, but I can't promise you when. It might be like never. And <laughs> so instead, there's an alternative. The alternative is we will build an addition that will have all of these high-tech labs that you so badly want, and over time, we'll look for money to renovate the existing building. And so that's the approach we took, and we're just completing all of that now as I uh, finish my 10th year as dean. So first, the addition. Uh, the addition cost $46 million. We dedicated it in October of 2014, and this is the facility that includes these labs for nano and bio, uh, and it, it's really just for mechanical engineering faculty members. You'll see a, a screen there on uh, the upper picture with the big block M. 
that's, that's for real. We do a lot of artistic things in our part of campus. In fact, engineering does, does pretty much everything that's artistic on our end of campus in terms of displays and sculpture and what have you. That is not a high resolution display. Instead, uh, the sheathing on the building there uh, is metal and we uh, embedded LEDs about every eight or 10 inches. And it's all computer controlled and uh, we use that for a variety of purposes. Uh, there's an atrium that connects uh, the new building and the old building. We'll see that in just a second. What about the renovation? The renovation we're just completing now. Uh, and that has, took us a little longer to line up the funding for that. That's a $50 million project. A whole lot of it is just replacing air handling units and things like that. But we've also created much, much better space for our students in terms of uh, classrooms and especially project space. Uh, our ME curriculum requires uh, design uh, at every single year of the curriculum. So the ME students have design courses, freshman, sophomore, junior, senior. And uh, we've got a way better setup now for those uh, design classes. Um, this is the atrium that connects the two sides, and it's all pretty seamless. This was when the new building was opened. On the left is the old building, when we really hadn't begun the renovation of that yet. Uh, the areas that look kind of shiny on the left are all now windows that look into the design labs in mechanical engineering. So when one is in the atrium now, you can wander around and just see what the students are working on, and they can also display the things they build uh, right in the atrium. Uh, the centerpiece of this facility is a set of low vibration labs. We have eight of these, and uh, they're very special. Uh, that center thing with the, the, the cylinder protruding from it is a block of concrete that goes eight feet into the earth. And the vibration specs that we have to meet are way more stringent than for our optics labs. That may sound hard to believe, but our ME faculty are running experiments where if they have a little shake or wiggle on the order of a nanometer, if that happens even once during their, say, six or eight hour experiment, it ruins the whole experiment. So no such thing as RMS error and kind of, you know, other kinds of, <coughs> errors. they're worried about peak error. So we've got uh, thick concrete and then we've got active vibration control on top of these things. And so these are very, very, very special parts of the building. Um, the temperature is regulated to within a tenth of a degree Celsius. Humidity is regulated to within 5%. Uh, and you can see the, uh, the heating cooling system. It's panels. It's not air. Uh, again, to keep things very low in vibration. When you're inside these chambers, it's, it's completely spooky because it's basically an anechoic sort of chamber with huge thick doors. But this is what our faculty needed for their research. Um, other labs in, uh, at the nanoscale level uh, for heat transfer. Um, as well as uh, manufacturing at the nanoscale. So it's all in this building. I mentioned the LED screen on the side. Um, it, it's a pretty neat thing. We're on what's called North Campus at Michigan, and I refer to these as the Northern Lights. It's just an enormous <laughs> thing. But actually, we use it uh, to display uh, uh, at least semblances of the type of research going on in the building, which is a pretty neat thing. Uh, you might wonder whether this system has been hacked. It has. We've seen Pac-Man and other things on the screen, uh, but that just, that just adds to, to the entertainment value. So, thank you. I'll go to this side. How's that? So, uh, you know, just listening to my uh, fellow deans here, let me ask all of you, how many of you have designed programs in the, in the works? See, that's, uh, you know, th there's something happening here. And, you know, there is a huge demand for design. And when I was listening to Dave, you know, I think that we are really, we're really pretty good in engineering and bringing art and bringing re really the creative instinct into our students. And that, a lot of what we're going to do, what, we, what we're planning to do here is not just design as in the sense of industrial design, but really bringing, uh, bringing the humanities and really, uh, and really art into our curriculum. And uh, certainly industry seems to have a uh, big need for them. So we began this, uh, you know, this program in design innovation four years ago. And the plan was really to manifest this sort of uh, Steve Jobs effect of making beautiful things for creating an itch in people for things that they didn't know they wanted. You know, that's really, and by the way, uh, Dean Dirks uh, talked about this as well. And that's, that's this is really a big opportunity, I feel for us in engineering education. So 
for ours, I'll stick to talking a little bit about uh, you know doing these projects and really, as you as you heard from these numbers, you know getting these things done in a reasonable amount of time and not spending a lot of money is really is really pretty important. So let me sort of stick to that piece of it. Uh, with, with the cornerstone support of uh, the Qualcomm Executive Chairman, Paul Jacobs, who you'll hear from also this evening, we launched this in summer 2013. And in less than two years, we designed the building and we had it open fall semester, August 2015. So, you know, it's really important to go from when you want to do it to getting it done. And, you, you know, we built 24,000 square feet of four floors. And uh, because we took a lot of input from the students, you know, there are almost no faculty offices in here. You know, the traditional uh, college buildings have uh, undergraduates in the basement, uh, I don't know, <laughs> classrooms on the first floor, and faculty in the exalted heights, right? And so uh, they said, no, no, these are mainly studios, and really this sort of studio model. It's a little different from the studio model in architecture where, you know, these are soloists. So here it's really for group studios, and I think you heard a lot of that in the presentations that you talked about. You know, people want to collaborate even in libraries. And it's really it's so wonderful to see these themes come up in every one of the presentations. The, the other thing I'll, uh, so let me just say one more thing about uh, uh, how we built this building. You know, it's important, and you heard this also from my colleagues, you know, it's important to build beautiful things. I think it really makes a difference. And uh, uh, Louis was talking about it, you know, how beautiful it was and how it really stimulates people to come in here. It was important for us to build sort of really a, something that looks like a jewel box, you know, and it's uh, something that the neighbors love. And, and by the way, uh, Dave also talked about bringing art into these. So, you know, it really makes a huge difference. In our, and the other thing I wanted to say is in terms of getting it done, you know, the innovation we used also in innovation and philanthropy. Needless to say, Paul really bankrolled most of the building. But having said that, really, if you move quickly with realistic budgets, you know, you really can keep a lid on expenses. And in some ways, I'll encourage all of you that are thinking about buildings, that, you know, you lean on campus uh, building offices and so on and so forth, that you are the real customer and that you need to be in the loop at every step of the way. Because, you know, I think we're all notorious in academia for doing cost overruns and so on and so forth. Let me just say a few things about how we did design. So the design of the building itself, inclusive. You know, it's really critical here to have inclusiveness on many, many levels. Uh, levels of students, uh, the different ethnic composition of the students, even the types of students from across campus. And it's really, really critical to have them come in to do the visioning with the architects even before the architects come along and do it. And, and, they, and to talk about what they would need for hands-on and collaborative learning. So we also ask students to participate in the design, and you'll see this in the building, you know, some of the murals and the wall panels, hands are the tools of design, that's the picture that you see on the bottom right, was something that we got out of the students. And the project delivery methods were, you know, it's not just design build, it's best value, you know, if you think that the price of concrete's going up in China, then you sort of get your parts of your design done early, fast track delivery, building information models. So all, all of that was part of the education of the design students. The design students were actually helping design the building and getting credits. We should, I should say, and I'm gonna turn the floor over to uh, Dave's uh, pinch hitter now, Dave Dornfeld's pinch hitter, Bjorn Hartman, who'll tell you a little more about the programmatics. But you know, I wanna say that the, one of the biggest innovations, I think, is in this design innovation space is that we're gonna reinvent engineering education. And I'd really invite all of us to do it together. You know, think of this as like the anti-MOOC. You know, I think that this is uh, not on the stage, it's not the stage on the stage, it's the coach on the sidelines, it's hands-on, it's a customized education. You know, if we can customize everything else in our lives, why can't we customize education? And why can't we do it without breaking the bank? And I really hope that you will participate with us. And you know, I think I don't want to steal any more of Paul's thunder. So you'll hear from Paul about sort of his personal passion. So I, uh, I hope that, uh, what am I doing? Am I turning this over to you and me? <laughs> good job, good job. We all recognize that 
<laughs> the wealth of knowledge is actually in the audience. <laughs> and so we're going to uh, open this up to the floor uh, for any questions. Who wants to go? I... Wow. <laughs> go Anybody, go, 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 go. far away. So, so my, I, I would agree with what Shankar said, and that is basically share the vision and the perspective of, of the broad group of stakeholders that have been engaged in creating the concept behind you know, the building that you're going to be talking about and you know, what aspects of that you want it to be inspiring as well as sort of sustaining uh, for the future. I mean, I, I think all of us you know, really put a great deal of effort into thinking about spaces for students to be together and to work together um, and to leverage themselves. And, and I know at least in our design, we were retrofitting an, an old warehouse and it was remarkable to see the creativity of the architects in capturing sort of the spirit of what we shared with them in terms of the inspiration we had gotten from the students, you know, the donors and others and what this space should be. So I, th I think try and create that inspiration in your architects. The, the only other thing, so certainly starting with, you know, what people want is the important one. In terms of pragmatics, you know, it's very important with an architect to think about how they'll execute. So you have options about having somebody architect and then someone build. You have an option of having design build, or you can have, uh, you know, the builder come on halfway through the design process. And all of these actually have dr sometimes quite dramatic implications for the cost, especially in San Francisco, by the way, since I presume, <laughs> if, I, if you don't mind my saying so. So I do think that as you proceed, you know, you really need to be vigilant about how you structure that design build or. Yeah, I, I, what I would say is, I mean, you already have, you're going to have this meeting with them, right? But, but the real key is, what is the message that you're trying to send and what is the vision you have going forward that actually should play a role in the selection of the designers? Mm -hmm. right. I mean, they have a track record. You know, when our folks in the library, Susan Nutter is the head of our library system, she's the one that gets all the credit as far as I'm concerned for this. She really scoped out who are the individuals that could come up with designs that would carry the kind of messages that we wanted to carry forward. So now if you already have them, then you have some sense of what they've done or what they think about. How do you translate that? But I would say if you have the opportunity to really put that message out in your own minds before you make those selections, that's really important because you know they have their philosophies. I mean, these folks that did this building at the Hunt Library, they had done the library in Alexandria, Egypt, the 9/11 Memorial. I mean, it's that you know that that kind of thought process about compelling, strong messages and. As far as I'm concerned, that probably impacted their selection much more than anything else. There's a lot of discussion about the, the, um, the importance of engaging stakeholders, in particular because research is changing, student demographics are changing. What are some of the specific processes that, that you found were effective in getting input from stakeholders and, and bringing it into the design process? And how early do you need to start doing that? You know, in our building processes, and I've been through many of them, um, it's sort of a funnel. So we start out early on uh, with wide consultation uh, with faculty and students, and depending on the type of facility. And uh, then once the design starts to harden a little bit, we form a smaller committee that still has some representation from, say, maybe the faculty in that department, if it's a departmental building. But we really winnow it down, because you can no longer have this huge group uh, really calling all the, all the detailed shots. Excellent. Yeah. I mean, I, I think the toughest part of this is to have people not be thinking about themselves. Mm. You know, in other words, you look at these facilities and things that we're doing and working on, this goes way out there into the future, and so it's to somehow have a group of individuals that understand that they themselves may not even benefit that much from it, but this is where you're going. It's not where you are or those particular needs, right? And uh, Dave says, I mean, that, you know, these, how do you create that right group of, it's always a challenge, but at the same time, 
if you don't do it that way, I think you're never going to take a step you're forward. You're going right? to miss something. You're going to really miss something, yeah. Ken Lucci from Boston University. These are spectacular facilities. And John, I want to get your feedback on something. We, similarly, we built about a 15,000 square foot engineering product innovation center, uh, which a giant maker space, transforming education, et cetera. One of the things, and we raised some money, obviously, to help build the structure and equip the structure. And then we I wanted to get your feedback on what we've done is try to build big partnerships with industry because the next step is funding this, running this facility mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. and staffing it and keeping the equipment on and going and so forth. So could you speak a little bit about, you know, you've got, it, 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 we were shocked at the MS, that the flock of students from every discipline, not only in engineering, but throughout the university that wanted to engage this facility to become a hub for design. Uh, around, across the whole university. But these are expensive things to keep running, and we're trying to get industry to help us provide those sources. What, were your, what have been your experiences? So, uh, so you know, you are, you've just, uh, this is like a fantastic, this is really a very, very important thing to think about, because it's not just the brick and mortar, mm -hmm. it's really the ops cost, and getting an estimate of the ops cost, and, w and by the way, having generous staffing is critical not only because you really instantaneously overrun with demand because you know students love it they want these buildings open uh, 16 hours 24 hours you, you know you have three three shifts of staff i think that the so certainly and uh, i know we have uh, folks from industry you know we really do need to lean on industry but I also think a, and I, I'd be slightly, I'll walk on thin ice out here. I do think we need to challenge our university administrations about helping provide some of the instructional money that's needed to, for this kind of education. And of course, the challenge in convincing a university administration is that, uh, you know, it's not going to break the bank, even though it really is a much more uh, sort of uh, people-intensive uh, uh, way of teaching. It does involve uh, really the whole village rather than a few people to teach, bringing in larger ecosystem. So these are all true, but I, I think that sort of having a sense of what that is, uh, perhaps even philanthropy to help start up. I, I, and the challenge with industry, if I can be, you know, industry is incredibly generous in supporting some things, and, but I think our challenge is to make sure, especially in these design spaces, to provide an education and not have <coughs> these places be uh, job shops. And sort of striking that balance is pretty, you know, really requires a lot of thought. Ken, I'll add that we've been able to run with a reasonably lean staff. The staff are critical, but those more senior students, um, they can be relied on for a lot. And, and so we, we run with student power mm -hmm. as much as staffing power. The thing that gets really expensive is some of the teams want to do really expensive things that require expensive materials and what have you. Uh, but at least with, for my competitive teams, I've got a number that will spend a half million dollars a year, sometimes maybe even a million dollars in a year. Uh, but most of that money comes from industry. If it's a competition, there are so many companies that want their name on the car or whatever it is. And, uh, and I don't arrange for that. The students actually do a lot of that fundraising themselves. To, to get to your point, Ken, on sort of the operational cost, in our case, one of the things we did is we were very fortunate that one of our sort of premier labs in electrical engineering and computer science had been endowed by a donor years before, and it has been able to stay state-of-the-art over almost two decades now because of that endowment. So when we put together our plan as far as the operational costs, we were very clear when we spoke to stakeholders, potential donors, that the actual physical renovation and equipment cost was probably only going to be about $20 million, and our goal was to raise another 20 or $25 million mm. in endowment. And so we were very clear with our stakeholders that we were speaking to, including industry in some cases, that the plan was to raise the funds that would allow it to keep operating for, mm -hmm. into the future. And I agree with what Dave said is, the senior students we use are fantastic helpers, and we also draw upon the Cleveland Institute of Art, which is an independent uh, academic institution that has a very reputable um, industrial design program. So about a third of our student helpers are from the industrial design program at the Cleveland Institute of Art, 
who basically are also donating their time, but we're getting then the synergies between the engineers and the designers in terms of the support that the students are receiving. Can I, can I ask a question of those of you in the room? How many of you utilize your seniors or juniors to actually uh, mitigate some of the staffing needs? Can I see by a show of hands? So that's a, that's a fairly big number. And, are the, and for those of you who pay those students to do that, can you show of hands? Those of you who don't pay, the students do it as volunteers? Some of each. Yeah, some of some each. Some of each. <laughs> Thanks. But, you know, I think it's great to use the students. I, I do want to say that, you know, safety is really a pretty big ticket item here. I, I do think you can manage, I, I'm not saying that you can't manage it with students, but I'd urge you to think very carefully about, uh, you, you know, we, I guess Bjorn will talk about, we have a makeup pass and is graded access to different rooms based on the levels of training and so on and so forth. You know, safety, I think really, you know, we are asking students to do a lot of things with moving parts and machinery that can hurt. So I, I really think uh, this needs to be an integral part of uh, thinking about operations. Uh, Jerry Holder from the University of Pittsburgh. Uh, I, I, the question I have was Ken's question, but I, I've got another part of that was uh, the space, uh, the, the, we saw some uh, variety of sizes of space that you created. Is, was there any like rule of thumb or you just, this is how much space I have and that's how big the facility is going to be or this is how much money I have and do you need to like, a, you know, 100 square foot per student or, or what, what's, the, what's the method you use to get to the size of the buildings that you build for uh, design purposes? So in our case, it was sort of twofold. We had a 3,000 and a f uh, square foot space we originally ran, then we expanded that to 4,500 based on student need. So as we, had, as we sort of realized we had this building on campus, we knew that that was gonna occupy one of the floors. We also looked at the frit footprint, for example, of all the disparate locations where we had machine shops, if you will, and use that as a guide for our, our uh, fourth floor. Then we looked at the student teams. We did some benchmarking, as I mentioned before, by going to the Wilson Center at University of Michigan. Um, and then looked at as we went up and provide increasing levels of services to support <coughs> innovation and entrepreneurship, how much space would we need for those things? And it, for us, it just sort of conveniently worked out that the scope of activities would fit in 7,000 square feet per floor. So even though that's what we had available, I don't think we worked to try and wedge that stuff or overexpand into that particular space. It, it really just sort of mapped into what the demand was and what the needs were as we saw the opportunities to add these additional dimensions. So, yeah. so you had like 30,000 square feet total? Um, we originally had about 40, as I said, 4,500, and then when we went, when we saw the new building, it was 7,000 square feet per floor, and we, we've elected to build out um, five and a half of the floors now. You, you know, uh, the, the, I'll sort of elaborate on this. You, you know, the studios and places where you teach, quite often a sweet spot is about 50 to 60 students, not too much more than that. That's 2,500 square feet. The, the meeting rooms and the sort of project yeah. rooms are the kind that uh, Jeff showed were, those were, you know, eight to 10 students, perhaps something around the order of 500 square feet. And, and, and the, the most important thing is whenever possible, try to make these spaces uh, flexible. You know, and nowadays you have uh, these things that are called DIRT wall, D-I-R-T-T, -T, it's an acronym, soundproof walls, which are quite often movable. And having all of those features and the movable furniture. And by the way, if there was one thing that you saw in all the presentations, it was sort of uh, furniture that wasn't anchored. Yeah. And it could be stacked. And you, you, I think you saw it in every single one of these. So all of those so flexibility for reconfiguration is really, I think, the best thing you can do. And, and these materials are really coming along. The soundproofing is pretty darn good with, the, these, uh, with this dirt. Right. Elizabeth Leboa, University of Missouri. Uh, could each of you go through a little bit with respect to the strate strategy of your funding model? Um, for those who are public, talk about how much you thought about for private philanthropy versus what you were pursuing for state dollars, if you were also bringing in industry. 
uh, what the strategy was and then also how you implemented it? There's only one private school well, here, huh? <laughs> Yeah, at Michigan, the first step in my strategy was uh, the summer I started as dean, we had a new provost. And, and so I took her through the existing building and, and the worst parts of that. And, and uh, <laughs> got, got her support for the notion that something needed to be done. And uh, then after that, it, it, at the University of Michigan, we tend not to get very much support from the state. And so uh, we have to do a lot of fundraising just from the College of Engineering. And then sometimes we're able to get some money from the campus. Uh, we got lucky with these two pieces of the project I mentioned, where with the addition, we were able to win a $10 million grant from NIST. Now, it took three tries and a whole lot of work, but we finally got some federal money to help with that. And with the renovation, it's very, very unusual for us to get any money from the state for a renovation, but we, we received $30 million to help us with the renovation. Otherwise, the renovation could not have occurred on, on the schedule I showed. Yeah, and in the case of North Carolina, we're really on the opposite edge of the spectrum. I think, Elizabeth, you know, been in a state that has traditionally been very, very supportive of higher ed. Now, that's been changing, but that Hunt Library, which is more than the engineering library, was a $115 million project, and I believe more than $90 million of that came directly from the state, right? So that's, a, now that's not the case anymore. We're working on a new engineering building, and at least half or more of that will have to be private, private funding. But that was the last facility built in the university system of North Carolina with that level of state funding. So part of the strategy there was to get it in under the wire, I think, is what, what happened. <laughs> but um, that was a big, big part of it, yeah. In, in our case, our university has essentially no more debt capacity and so basically we had we knew that going into this project we had to raise the money before we could break ground um, so that was our fundraising goal we, it was part of our capital campaign and we were very fortunate that some of our early donors also were sufficiently sophisticated enough to give us infinite flexibility in how to use the money so somebody asked, I think, the question about operating costs. One of our donors uh, very early on said you can use the money for anything. You can buy it for infrastructure. You can pay it, use it for heating and lighting, whatever you need. And so having a few key donors who then become your di disciples that you take out on the road to talk to others was really a key factor as well. Uh, in our case, I was, uh, we are perhaps not unlike either the privates or Michigan. They are, uh, Jacobs Hall was completely uh, supported by philanthropy and the operations as well uh, through a combination of all of the factors that all of you have talked about. I, I actually think that as time goes on, even in the public, you know, we are going to be called upon more and more to <coughs> do this. In our case, you know, anything major that we do in the college goes through the advisory board. And the College of Engineering Advisory Board certainly, it, it's not a fundraising board, but it is the board that signs off on all. It, it turns out that Paul's also the chair of my <laughs> college advisory board. So, you know, it's something he felt passionate about. And so that's, but I think that this model that I think all of us, uh, Louis, Louis, you're almost there as well. well it's, but it's I, I think, there quickly. Yeah, there quickly. I, I think that we are going to be called upon to bring the resources uh, increasingly. And, and this issue that you talked about, Jeff, you know, raising the money before the construction starts, that is pretty tough. You know, on the one hand, the university likes to do this because they want to be sure that they're not on the hook. But on the other hand, you know, I, I, I think that if you can get any leeway from the administration about having some fraction raised before you start and some that may that would make that may say made a huge difference in our lives and I'm, I'm sure it would make a difference in everybody's life out here as well uh, I'm Jyoti Murthy from UCLA um, so the, uh, it seems to me that buildings are a necessary condition yeah yeah so buildings are a necessary condition but they're not sufficient conditions so what are the big uh, innovations in curricula that are mapping to your buildings or vice versa? Uh, and what's the dean's role in making all of that happen? So I'll, 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 go, I'll go first again. So in our case, when we began the process, we specifically said that this was not curricular space. This was opportunities for students to have 
a, a large playground to play in and for us to support these other dimensions of innovation and entrepreneurship. That said, it's an awful important asset for our faculty to have to think about how they would enhance their pedagogical activities. So this past year, we formed a think tank that worked basically over the summer, and then I asked them to switch from being a think tank to a task force and come up with a number of initiatives that would drive the new engineering core to include things like innovation, entrepreneurship, experiential learning, and create a, a first and second year curriculum via a new core that was almost exclusively integrated and experiential and would use Thinkbox as a facility, as a resource, but not as a specifically curricular space. The only teaching that goes on or will go on within Thinkbox is the little bit of work, or the, that's actually a significant amount of work in mechanical engineering where the students actually get into the shop and that has highest priority for that space. Once the classes are done, anyone who wants to use that for any type of experiential project then has access to it after the, after the curricular part, the classes are done. Uh, you know, in our case, uh, I think the program, the students really, you know, there's one other, in addition to having an interest in design, you know, students are very interested in minors. And the questions about how you give them these tracks of a concentrated slug of classes without balkanizing the already balkanized landscape of university majors is something that we felt that we had to confront. So what we felt was uh, a minor in design innovation. And we started off with the business school, the architecture school, and fine arts as our initial set of four partners, even though biological sciences jumped right in right behind that, in trying to plan what it would take to have uh, a space to be able to offer this minor. And so uh, we'd had little experience with a completely different area, global poverty, and this is technology to lift people out of poverty. And so, but that gave us a little bit of a sense of uh, what, what a core should look like, uh, what the, uh, and, and so to us, the, the program really did precede the space. But having said that, I, I'm with Jeff, you know, th there's a general, uh, what I think what Jeff was saying is not a general assignment classroom no, space. And, th and that I think you've got to be cognizant of, and I think that's, uh, you know, it is for new, new programs. And I think, uh, and, and they're every bit, I think, uh, an important part of pedagogy. You know, lots of engineering students will say, give us 121 unit classes, because they really want the material chunked up into this fine grain. I, I don't think we know how to do this, but uh, you know, this is one uh, sort of via point. This has uh, really been fantastic because we're in the midst of a lot of this. And I'm a, uh, Franklin Boss. I'm Executive Associate Dean from Virginia Commonwealth University. One of my responsibilities is finance. So I'm really interested in when you say we raise this money. Is that the school or college of engineering or is it university? Or is it a partnership between the two? And how did that work for you? At Michigan, it's the College of Engineering. <laughs> <laughs> All right, follow on. Do you have your own uh, fundraising yeah, staff? There, there? I could say a little more. Um, <laughs> yeah, I have, I have my own fundraising staff. They report to me, my own events staff, my own thank you people, my own research people, and what have you. Uh, there is a central um, uh, fundraising unit, obviously, at any university, and we do work hand-in-hand -hand with them. But if we're talking about any of these kinds of construction projects, yeah, we raise um, probably every dollar in engineering, and we don't count on the central staff. Yeah, I, I, no, I was going to... Yeah, well, when, when I arrived at NC State, it's almost 10 years ago, one of the biggest problems I felt we had in the college was how lean, extremely lean, our own development group was in the college. And today's point, I mean, uh, we had a very decentralized kind of situation around the university. We had a very good foundation board in engineering. It was making them a lot more aware of their role in this, too. But, um, yeah, we will take whatever help we can get from around the university, but these things are not moving forward if it isn't because the college is doing a lot of the heavy lifting with them.
I'm Kathy Bangs from Texas A&M. I wanted to follow up on the curriculum issues. We've, uh, in our facilities such as this, we have been very successful with something we call pop-up classes. And mm -hmm. pop-up classes do not necessarily have any credit, but they're classes taught by faculty or, or users of the facility about the technology you can use to build something or create something. Students come on their own. It's not a, it's a scheduled time, but um, you don't register for the class. You show up, and they've been very popular, and students are very interested mm. in them. And that goes away from the traditional credit uh, uh, process. But on the other hand, it's a way of teaching the students without necessarily the baggage of the bureaucracy. Mm. Yep, we do the same. So uh, Daryl Pines, University of Maryland, questions for Dave. Yes. Uh, Dave, you, you were the only one of the three that talked about a renovation project. I think all right. the other buildings are brand right. new, and yours was a renovation as well. But now I'm gonna focus more on the research side. Yours is not doing research. So, mm -hmm. so one of the big questions we always deal with faculty is, how do you assign spaces, right? So you had a big mechanical engineering department, you have half the building is brand new, the other half is renovated. <laughs> how do you assign space, right? And, and I'm really just, your process maybe is what I'm really trying to understand. Uh, how did you do it? Because most, obviously most mechanical engineering faculty would have said, okay, just you know, bulldoze the old building, let's get a brand new full building right. at $150 million right. instead of what you kind of sort of piecemeal together to get it done. So I'm just wondering, what's your process for assigning space? <laughs> well, so we had a, a set of faculty, especially a lot of the newer faculty that were doing this bio and nano stuff, and, and it was clear that you know, they kind of had first call on, on new labs in a new building. Uh, in fact, you know, I don't know if they would receive tenure unless we could build this thing for them, right? They really needed this. Um, and then other faculty that were doing kind of the, the bigger stuff, combustion and what have you, they, they, they stayed put in, in the old part of the facility. But the old part of the facility is really being dressed up. And in fact, now when you walk from one to the other, it's pretty seamless. And so I think everybody's feeling pretty good. But then I had another set of faculty who work in transportation. So they're doing all the powertrain and what, what have you and the, and the engine dynos and that sort of thing. They're in a very old building. And uh, they weren't uh, necessarily happy campers. Um, there were other faculty, obviously, that were seriously upgraded in terms of their space. So we're doing um, just a, I, I'll say, a very light renovation of their space. It's just cosmetic. Uh, they have what they need in terms of the actual experimental facilities. It's just that it's not a, a pleasant place to live in, necessarily. But that's an issue, Daryl. And uh, we've had to have a lot of conversation. Well, I, if I'd known it was going to be the last question, there'd be a much better one than this. But uh, I'm J.B. Holston, University of Denver. Um, I noticed that there were no pictures of faculty offices. Mm -hmm in any of the uh, presentations. And so the question was, have any of you done away with those to any degree? And if so, how have you gone about that? It, so not in this, uh, not in the Jacobs Institute where we have a few faculty offices, but we've had a number of experiments in other buildings of sort of this open layout where faculty students uh, sit together and they're conference rooms and private rooms and so on and so forth. And I think it has been a mixed bag. Is the, you know, it, it was, uh, Silicon Valley put a lot of pressure on this was the way the offices of the future were going to look like. So we certainly tried them out, primarily in computer science, I'd say. Then we also had a building next door called Sutta Jardai where we started doing it. You know, my own sense is that you know, having private faculty offices is, is not such a bad idea. The question is not, you know, having a little bit of mobility uh, and really, you know, this idea of somebody staying in their office 35 years and then taking five years after that to clean out the office. <laughs> you know, that I think is something. And, and sort of to incentivize a little motion around is, uh, and, and you know, this, by the way, it, what Dave said, you know, the incentivization can be pretty modest. You know, this sort of lightweight uh, uh, renovation Cosmetic. quite often gives people, uh, you know, the impetus to go out. And uh, so I, I don't know if I'm sold on the idea of sort of completely giving up on the private offices. But, you know, it's an experiment worth, uh, worth trying out, at least for smaller groups. You know, we did this at five to ten faculty at a time. And yeah, the, the problem we have is that... Uh, we now have faculty that are not in their offices in the buildings because they're in the Hunt Library, okay? 
and uh, <laughs> they're actually spending nice. a lot of their time there. But what, what the library does have, though, is it has these spaces for faculty interaction and especially faculty development. And we've put an awful lot into, you know, really, I mean, we all, I think, say the same things. We want you to be successful, but the question is, are we doing those things that really help our faculty be successful? And a lot of what we've tried to do is put a lot of effort behind what we now call faculty advancement, including you know, mm -hmm. faculty development workshops that have been there for years, but now all sorts of other activities. And to have spaces where you can bring mentors and people together, faculty mentors with younger faculties and so on, in sort of neutral ground, which is what this provides, has been a real, real plus for that. So uh, there's many, many ways to use these spaces, right? In Michigan, I'd say we've done a good job of um, building shared research facilities, shared labs with multiple faculty in the space. But um, so far as I can tell, each of my faculty members still wants their individual office. I don't think there's yeah. any thought to go away from that. Please give our panelists a round of applause. So I uh, would like to invite you all to um, join us right after this session to walk across the street. There will be staff leading the way to the Jacobs Institute for Design Innovation. Uh, a couple of points to, to make. Um, we're very focused on supporting undergraduate students to not just build, but also learn the process of design. So learn the process of human-centered design, which is uncovering needs, not taking the problem statement as given, but really delving deep and figuring out what the problem actually is that you're, support, you're supposed to solve. Um, that may also uh, involve leaving the building and going out and observing. So for example, here are Amy Hurst students from bioengineering visiting local hospitals in the area to, um, to observe and interview nurses, patients, uh, physicians, to then develop the ideas that turn then into prototypes and, and products. And uh, Jacobs Hall provides a wide variety of spaces in which this designing, innovation, and, and making happens. And one way I think of what we're providing here for the students is the 21st century workshop. And for me, there are kind of three core uh, ingredients to that. One is, of course, the tools, the machine tools, the hardware. And predominantly, predominantly these are now all digital fabrication tools, right? So we don't have manual mills and, and lays in, in this building. It's all software driven, which also means the design software piece is kind of a, a crucial part um, to what makes work in this building happen. And then everything these days has um, a CPU in it, right? There's a microcontroller that's going to be programmed in every product that you pick off the shelf. And what I find really uh, interesting about just this overview is that it immediately shows you how it brings together so many different engineering disciplines. Right? There's a home for computer science in here. There's a home for electrical engineering. There's a home for mechanical engineering. There's a home for civil and, uh, and other disciplines, but it goes beyond engineering because the design software itself, as it gets better and higher level, levels the playing field and invites other disciplines from the arts to the social sciences to, um, um, to play as well. So um, Shankar also had some of these uh, statistics. Over the first two semesters, so we're just now in the middle of our second semester, um, we've had students from 15 departments uh, in the building. We've offered just over 50 courses and had just over 3,000 students enrolled. There was a question early on about curriculum, so here is our rough stab at this. Uh, the color coding here shows that things shown in green are basically new building blocks that we provide, that we offer as the Jacobs Institute. And pieces in red is where you slot in all of the core design courses that already exist in different disciplines. So at the bottom, we have a new course on just discovering design. What is design? What are the different disciplines? I hear about industrial, about product, about graphic design. What do they have in common? So a very low uh, barrier to entry to get students interested um, in this world. Then we have a couple of skill components. So um, learning about design process, learning about how to communicate ideas visually with or without software, uh, and then also just a, a cor course on core skills and prototyping and fabrication. And the idea is that students take these skills and survey courses at 
the freshman to sophomore level so that they bring all those skills into their disciplinary design courses. And then we also have interdisciplinary courses that we level, uh, that we layer on top as well. Just a couple of impressions. Here is our freshman sophomore prototyping and fabrication uh, course where um, our faculty actually have a combined background in EECS and in artistic uh, product design. And so here the students within the first month are learning about microcontroller programming and uh, mechanism design to build drawing machines. Now, in addition to our curricular uh, program, faculty-led courses, a major part of the activity in Jacobs Hall are student-led programs. This is a snapshot of the student-led uh, graphic design club, and they pack our biggest room. Similarly with uh, web design and, and other courses. So the students really uh, take ownership of that space and um, we, they're kind of the, the canaries that tell us what, where our curriculum is incomplete and where really we need to build out additional pieces. Just to uh, finish up here, I'd like to just show you three of the types of projects that have come out in, in the... Um, in the past nine months out of Jacobs Hall. Here are two undergraduate students working on augmented power tools, imagining there's got to be a continuum between the dumb motor on a grip that you buy at Home Depot and the 3D printer where you press start and everything happens automatically. So they're augmenting power tools with sensors and projectors to, for example, then give you automatic uh, projected feedback and you can imagine loading a home improvement project into your tool and having your tool guide you along the way. And this uh, takes advantage of basically cell phone sensors uh, developed for detecting whether you hold a, a phone up to, to your ear. So they are now ubiquitously and, and cheaply available. Uh, here's another great project. Um, this is a fixture level uh, uh, water use sensor that is powered by water pressure because you don't really want to plug something in that is with you in the shower. <laughs> <laughs> so there's a, a 3D printed impeller, there's some magnets along the periphery and um, induce a current. You have a very low uh, energy microcontroller that then takes readings and sends that uh, to a smartphone. I'm uh, happy to report that this is a, a Berkeley pioneer technology that's now deployed in Stanford at the dorms. <laughs> <laughs> and uh, here, here just um, a final project. This one's a little whimsical. This is a rocking chair with a pendulum at the bottom that uh, then the, you know, harvests some kinetic energy to charge your phone. And <laughs> Um, what, I, what I'd like to foreground about this uh, is just the sheer variety of materials and process in, involved, right? So the students actually went outside of Jacobs Hall to Davis to, our, um, to a welding shop of civil engineering and used their welding facilities. So we're trying to build a network of different fabrication facilities because the students certainly have more hunger than 24,000 uh, square feet. So we're building a network of collaborating uh, shops and facilities um, across campus. Um, and then some of the woodworking actually came from an architecture student who had a lot of uh, experience in, in model building. So that itself was a very interdisciplinary project between architecture, uh, EE, NCS, and cognitive science. Just a word on, on staff. Uh, as Shankar mentioned, um, staff to run one of these facilities is critical. We have uh, five or six technical staff, some part-time, some full-time, who just um, are responsible for safety, for training, for machine maintenance, but they all are also practicing designers with a mixture of art and, and engineering background, so they all function as design mentors. Um, and just to point out, in the lower right, Eric Paulus is our chief learning officer, and he will be on-site in Jacobs Hall as well. So if you have any um, questions, the staff will be there, Eric and I will be there as well, so please come up to us and, and ask us questions. And just for reference, uh, after you visit, if you want to find out more about the Jacobs Institute, you have your booklet, but there's also design.berkeley.edu. 
Thank you.